Hello and welcome to the latest Royal Roundup from Talk TV. So pop the kettle on. This is the Royal Tea. I'm Sarah Hewson. Has the King finally called time on Harry and Meghan? We'll of course be talking about Frogsit as well as coronation news and much more on today's show. Joining me are Royal commentator Emily Andrews, The Sun's Royal photographer Arthur Edwards and Talk TV Royal commentator Rupert Bell. You just can't keep them off the front pages. Our very own Matt Wilkinson broke the story this week that the Sussexes are being booted out of Frogmore Cottage to make way for none other than Prince Andrew. Uh, Arthur, what do you make of this news? I think, um, I think I'm about time the King really hit back, you know, at the accusations uh, about his wife, you know, uh, Camilla, the lovely Camilla, who's, you know, he's, is he calls my darling wife. Um, and and Harry called her the around. wicked yeah. stepmother. And, wicked, and also accused her of, of leaking stories. Well, she didn't leak any to me. And, uh, and I felt that was awful. And I just wondered what he was going to do about it. And I thought he was like, they just do, you know, never complain, never explain. But of course now he's, I think it's a brilliant idea, kick him out there. And I think if they carry on like this, rubbish in the royal family, I think they'll lose their titles next. I think he'll take the you know, bold step and do that because it's, it's just undermining all the good work he's doing. Ever since he's become our king, he's been brilliant. You know, his speeches to the nation, uh, the way he's gone around the country, you know, the smallest little jobs. I mean, I'm doing an engagement with him next week. He's going to an Age UK event, you know, and he'll sit there and he'll make the, those people laugh and, and, and have fun, and he's done a brilliant job. And this is this couple sniping away over there. It's just doing the royal family and, and our country, quite honestly, no good at all. Apparently, Rupert, discussions about this have been going on for seven weeks. If you count backwards, that takes us to the first couple of weeks of January. What happened then? <laughs> uh, well, we had, we, I think we've we done, we done, we've given six hours of our life away watching that Netflix documentary, followed by the book Spare, which ruined my holiday having to read it. Um, but I think, actually, they looked at it and just went, enough's enough. And that's by doing this, it's saying to them, right, you can trash us for all you like. We can't say anything because we are in the never explain camp and there's no point having a war of words. But our actions, and by saying, well, you don't want to be here, your lease is up, your time is up. But he's still got the problem lurking in the wings, which is Prince Andrew. Because those are the two things that are, are causing the, the sort of soap opera element to the royal family. And as Arthur said, the king is trying to just get on with his job, as are the Prince and Princess of Wales. And is this about, Emily, trying to get all of this sorted before the coronation? So the two big family problems, Harry and Prince Andrew. Can Prince Andrew afford Royal Lodge? Perhaps not. Give him a smaller house to well, live in. I think there's a couple of issues here on this merry-go-round of mansions. I think there's the money issue, so cost cutting. At the moment, Charles is having to pay out of his own pocket private security for Andrew whilst he lives in Royal Lodge, because of course Andrew's not a full-time working royal anymore, so he lost his Metropolitan Police. It's only him and Sarah and the dogs, isn't it? Yes. They don't need a 30 room mansion. But they don't need a 30 room mansion, but what they do need apparently is security that Charles is having to pay for. Take them out of Royal Lodge, put them within the secure Windsor estate of which Frogmore Cottage is part, suddenly Charles's bill goes down. And of course, Royal Lodge, which we know needs renovation, if it were to be given to William and Catherine, then those renovations would be paid for by the Crown Estate instead of Charles having to stump up the bill. So there's the money issue, which kind of makes sense for what he wants to do. The other issue, as you say, is those kind of two massive PR problems, Prince Andrew and Prince Harry. And we've talked a lot about what Prince Harry and Meghan have said about the royal family. And as Arthur and Rupert have said, you know, it's been the kind of constant brickbats being thrown by those two. And, and Charles and has said nothing and William has said nothing. So this really is King Charles, I think, drawing a line or trying to draw a line under the whole sorry saga before the coronation, which is almost like a royal reset. But what does it mean then for the coronation? Because Harry wants an apology if he's to accept an invitation to come. This isn't conciliatory action, is it? No, it's not. And some people read this as, wait for it, Arthur. Some people, I know not you, my dear, will read this as King Charles being vindictive and cruel, taking away Frogmore Cottage. There's, there's, there's a shaking of heads from the gentleman <laughs> over there. No. Taking away Frogmore Cottage, which is protected and where Harry feels safe. We know that Harry's very paranoid about his security and that he only really feels safe within those protected environs in Windsor. 
Charles has offered him an olive branch. He says, keep Frogmore Cottage until June. We still want you to come to the coronation. Come to the coronation and pack your bags while you're here. They don't want Harry and Meghan Willoughby, won't they come, to, to dominate the agenda before the coronation. This is not about them anymore. It's about this amazing event that the whole world's going to watch. They don't want all this, you know, where we want an apology, because they won't get an apology. They don't reply by the RSVP. They won't be coming. But Arthur, they were given this house by the Queen as a wedding yeah. gift. It's now being taken away from them. It leaves them without a UK residence. Got, uh, is it, as they've said, you know, very final and as if they want to cut them out forever? Well, you know, it looks that way, doesn't it? But I mean, there's plenty of room at Buckingham Palace and Windsor Castle where they could stay. Uh, that's, not a, that's not the problem. The problem is that they're annoyed that the, finally the king has hit back. He's not going to stand it anymore. Mm. Harry's screaming at him down the phone. He doesn't want that anymore. You know, he's, he's, he's tried very hard. Any speech to the nation, he welcomed them. He wanted them to come. He would love his son back here. Of course he would. But he's not going to take this tantrums. And, 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 you know, I think Harry will come. I don't think Meghan will come, though. I think she'll stay back. I think she'll uh, decide to leave, leave, it, well, leave it alone. But, um, you know, that's my, my view. But, you know, I think uh, they do not want, I know they just desperately do not want this whole thing to start dominating this event because it's not about them. I think, I think it's a very sensible, actually, power play. If you take a step backwards, all the power has been with Harry and Meghan. You know, they've been making all these accusations, saying everything, knowing that the royal family aren't going to be able to answer back. King Charles has taken back control and he said, actually, I'm in charge here, taken away Frogmore Cottage. And if you, and I'm going to invite you to the coronation, if you want to come or you don't want to come, that's fine, but I'm in charge. And it, I think it weakens Harry and Meghan because actually if they don't come to the coronation, they don't, they don't re burnish that their royal brand what does that then give them you know trying to make money in LA but what if you take the family politics out of this and you look at Charles's big plan which is to slim down the monarchy and cut costs if you have this big cottage uh, not what most of us would describe as a cottage but if you have Frogmore Cottage sitting empty until Harry and Meghan decide they fancy a long weekend uh, back here how does that look? It, this is it. The optics don't look great because, again, it looks wasteful. The whole point now, the king has made it quite clear, he wants a slimmed down, fit for purpose monarchy. That's his whole mantra and we can see what he's trying to do. And to have a, a cottage sitting empty, will it be occasionally visited by um, Harry and Meghan, who clearly don't want to be here? They've made it quite clear they're not, they don't like the institution. Um, they want to bond again with their families, but I think the bridges have been well and truly burnt, and I can see what the King's trying to do, make it a monarchy fit for purpose, and having a 30-room house that, uh, with uh, the Duke of York sitting in, well, that seems pointless, why not move him in there, and then we can control him, but those are the still, that we come back to, they're still the two sort of cankers within the royal household mm. that the King is desperate to get sorted out, and uh, then he can move on with confidence. Well, the other story raising eyebrows this week for the royal family was the King's meeting on Monday with Ursula von der Leyen, just after she had announced the details of the Windsor framework with Rishi Sunak, at just a short distance from Windsor Castle, conveniently, meaning she could take tea with the King. Has he been dragged into the political fray? Has he entered it willingly? I, my personal position is this was a bad move for Charles. Now, I know, I thought it was very interesting that the palace, Buckingham Palace said, no, 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 we didn't, we didn't organise this. It was at the request of the government. And then number 10 was saying, no, 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 it wasn't us, it was the palace. And then um, Ursula von Leyen's people saying, no, we don't really know who organised this. It just kind of happened. No one was prepared to say, actually, we wanted this to happen. Charles has been a campaigning prince and he's done some amazing stuff in his time. But as monarch, as we've just been talking about, as monarch, you have to put family aside you have to be a higher being he's had to take some really difficult decisions on harry and Meghan, and you have to be about politics for me him meeting the eu president to rubber stamp that deal was not appropriate he should be completely above any kind of politics and any kind of suggestion that he's being embroiled into politics and rishi sunak should not have put him in that position to try and sell that deal to the rest of his party and the rest of the country would the queen have got into this position arthur i don't know you know i mean you know, Ursula von der Leyen is, uh, is president of the European Union. And uh, that's a pretty powerful position. I mean, the week before the president of Poland was in, he went for tea at the palace. 
don't see what's wrong with her going there. I know it was that deal. I know that deal was signed, but you know, I think Prince Charles uh, sees this as a, a way to get this deal through and get it get the the DUP back in Parliament in, in Is it his in place to get it no, through? No, I know, but you know, he's not going to campaign. He's always campaigned for the for the underdog in all his life, and he's always, when he was the Prince of Wales, campaigned, and he and he made amazing speeches about things. He can't do that now, but that gesture gives us support to to Rishi and that deal. And I think that was I think it was a brilliant idea. And I didn't think when I looked at the picture, I thought, okay, it might upset some people, but it's actually the king, as Arthur said, he is president of the European Union, which is a huge organization, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Yes, there is a political angle, of course, with being head of state. But he's going, but Charles and Camilla, as their first overseas state visits, are going to Berlin and Paris, to Germany and France. And that is a kind of EU Brexit slash first tour. You know, the government asked for the King and the Queen's, their first overseas visit to go to France and Germany, our closest neighbours. Great. That's exactly what they should be doing to try and repair some of that kind of ruptured relationship that we have with the EU. But for him to meet Ursula von der Leyen on the day that that was signed, for me, it's the timing. He shouldn't have done it. Well, as the coronation draws nearer every week, we will update you with all of the latest news and the announcements coming from the palace. This is Coronation Check-In. <laughs> For 900 years, convention has dictated that no other crowned rules should be present at the coronation of a British monarch. The tradition has stood because the sacred ceremony is intended to be an intimate exchange between the monarch and their people in the presence of God. But as part of his plan to modernise the ceremony, Charles has decided to invite his crowned friends from across the globe, we're told. Arthur, we've just been talking about soft power and diplomacy. Is that what this is about here? What, the, inviting all his mates. <laughs> <laughs> Having a party, a royal party. All around the world. I mean, you know, I mean, he knows all these people. They're, they're, they, they're, he's on first name terms with every one of these the monarchs in Europe and they, and they meet each other regularly. I mean, when the Queen used to have a, a, a jubilee event, uh, a jubilee events, she used to have a lunch for all these and they would greet each other like brothers and sisters, and it, it, it'd be natural for him to do that. And you remember when the Queen uh, was crowned, I mean, it, was, it was a different state of affairs then. The country was just recovered from the war. It, it was, um, it was, it was, it wasn't, the country wasn't the same. Now, of course, with, with communications and everything, and the way that he has travelled to all these countries, met them several times, Sweden, Denmark, all, you know, it, it's natural that he would invite them. And I hope he invites... Uh, President Biden as well, and a few others, and, and the Commonwealth uh, uh, presidents. And I think it's just, um, it'd be just wonderful he does that. It's a slim down guest list, though, isn't it? And, and I just wonder if you're talking about modernising the monarchy and the ceremony, Rupert, whether this is the right image to be projecting. Uh, I think, well, they're all rel most of them are relatives, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think German ones are. Uh, and a few others, but so therefore you have to say that you know why why not you know the, the monarchies are diminishing around the world, and I think he's he's proud of the institution and he's offering support to other countries who have a have a monarchy, and I think it's nothing wrong with that. I think the problem is where do you make the cut off? There's two thousand people allowed in the Abbey, when you think there were eight thousand, um, and I must I was speaking to a Lord of the Realm who was at the last um, as a boy at fifteen. And they, in this particular Lord of the Realm's father, said, I don't want to go in because I want him outside. And he, two doors down the road, there was an old coward sitting on his seat. And he never has forgotten that. And that's the guess, but it won't happen this time because there were 8,000 in the Westminster Abbey and I can't, um, I don't know where they're going to go. It's 2,000 this time, isn't it? Uh, Camilla has reportedly indicated, Emily, that she'd like her grandchildren to be involved in the ceremony, perhaps holding the canopy mm. as she's anointed uh, with the holy oil. Um, the blended family being played out in this most historic of occasions. Indeed, that's one way of looking at it. And I'm from a blended family and I have a step grandfather whom I was very, very close to, step cousins. Um, so on the one hand, I think if you're from a blended family, that's great and it celebrates the diversity and the modernity of where we are in the 21st century. You know, we haven't had a coronation for 70 years. A lot, as Arthur said, a lot has changed since then. On the other hand, for me, I think it strikes a bit of an odd note if you have the step grandchildren of the king. And I know, you know, he has, as we know, you know, 
Charles is close to Camilla's grandchildren, but you've got the step-grandchildren of, of the king, and I know they're Camilla's grandchildren, holding the canopy. And, and potentially we don't have Harry and Meghan or Lilibet and, and Archie there. Now, I know Archie and Lilibet are very young, but I just think it strikes a really fractured note where you've got this family, these family members doing this very, very important job, but you've got other family members who, because of, you know, there's no bridges being built, are, are, are back in the US. I, I mean, it, uh, I think you'll probably be supportive of this. Where you're like, I mean, it's, Cam it is Cam it's Camilla's coronation. I'm going to tell you exactly. And also, I, I want to ask Camilla, what makes you happy? Mm -hmm. First thing she said is being married to the prince. And the second thing she says, my grandchildren. Oh. That's what being with her grandchildren makes her happy. And, and I know when the king goes over to, the, to their, he, they, he, he has a fabulous time with them. So he, he would include them and she would include them. Why not? I mean, she's, she's part of this. You know, she's not just, uh, uh, she's a, very important part and you know from that day on we'll be probably calling her just the Queen you know and that's going to be it and we'll know her as Queen and, and uh, why not I mean you know one of the bride one of her grandchildren was a bridesmaid to Catherine so you know it, I think it's just normal I think it's a normal thing. And a role for Prince George being discussed as well. well yes Rupert. but I think uh, he's still a young boy but he, I think that why they would like that in a sense for, for, for George is the sense of succession yeah of course because that's that is clearly that we can see where it's going yeah. and I think that makes sense how they incorporate and I think they're trying to make sure that it's not over the top or whatever but I, I think that uh, getting some duchesses holding uh, well, are there probably less duchess to get hold of nowadays <laughs> than there were back well, one years. of them certainly in Montecito <laughs> <laughs> she might be unavailable <laughs> as, long, as long as they don't get Louis there that's yeah. alright yeah. can you imagine yeah. him bombing yeah. down yeah. the yeah. aisle yeah. oh god <laughs> Yeah, no. Great pictures, though. It would be yeah, great yeah. pictures. And Arthur alluded. Arthur, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, well, that would make it really, yeah, wouldn't it? Would, it? Yeah, that would make yeah. it for me. Uh, Arthur alluded to it there. Uh, Queen Consort now mm. to be known as Queen after the coronation. It's a, it's a technicality, really, well, isn't it? A linguistic technicality. Queen Consort is a job. It's not mm. a title. It's a job. She is the consort of the monarch, and it's it's opposed to Queen Regnant, which obviously Elizabeth was the ruling queen. It makes that distinction. Um, when we have king, it is obviously that that person is the is the monarch. Where there's no two bones about that, because the husband of a of a female monarch is never style king. So it is to make that very clear distinction. To me, she's always been Queen Camilla. I think it was slick PR from the palace to have Queen Elizabeth put out that statement on the anniversary of her ex accession, saying when the time comes, I would like her to be known as Queen Camilla, because of course we all remember when Didn't they got she married. Didn't she like to be known as Queen Consort? Queen Consort, Consort. Consort. Queen she Consort did, was it wish. was. She says, my wish. My wish. And you might as well write that down. As <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah. Her wishes, yeah. So it was a very canny move, as Arthur says and, and Rupert says, you know, it was absolutely right that was going to happen. The Queen, I think, as we now know, probably knew that it wouldn't be long before that moment would come that Charles was king. So Camilla was going to be Queen Consort, but I think it was a clever PR move because she had always, it had always been said that she was going to be... I think the princess, princess consort, consort yeah. which is clumsy and not correct. And after the coronation, you know, it's been enough time after the death of our amazing Queen Elizabeth for then Camilla just to be queen. And in fact, some newspapers, I think, already have already dropped the consort. Already yeah, the Camilla. Times already yeah. calls her Queen Camilla. On Saturday evening, Prince Harry will take part in a live stream Q&A with trauma expert Dr Gabor Mate, during which they'll discuss living with loss and the importance of personal healing. Tickets are £17 and they include a copy of Spare, if you don't already have one. Uh, those who book the tickets can also submit a question, with some, no doubt, very carefully chosen to be put to the Duke by a moderator during the event. So to my panel, what would you ask Harry? Rupert. Um, why did you do it? Arthur, and, and, and would you get an uh, yeah? Well, I can't, with an ad addendum, what about thinking about other people's feelings? You're all about yours, but what about you've done to others? Arthur? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, rubbish and, uh, rubbish and his brother talking about that scuff. I mean, everyone has a fight with their brother, making that a big, big deal when it was just a, a scuffle. Rubbish and Camilla and, and just... Uh, talking about smoking drugs in his book. I mean, it just to me, it was, it was just, I just think he's a miserable bugger now. I just think, I can't really say that, but he, I, think he's a, I think he's a very miserable person now. I don't think he's at all happy. And all they're doing is making money. Well, you know, Harry, I tell you now, money don't make you happy. Being a prince of the realm in this country, you were somebody. 
and now you're just another celebrity in a town full of celebrities. Yeah, I think my question belongs at, are you happy? Has this made you happy? What about you, Emily? I think I say, Harry, have you had a hair transplant? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't expect a reply. <laughs> Talking of questions, The Late Show with Stephen Colbert has released a clip of Harry taking part in a quick fire round. Uh, light hearted, um, but what did we learn? Emily, you've, you've seen this. It's the Colbert questionnaire. Yeah. I mean, Michelle Obama's taken part in it. Yes. Blanchett before. Yes, so it's a Harry. real kind of uh, stalwart of the programme. Uh, and he's obviously one of the best interviewers, TV personalities in America. I mean, it was quite funny. Ha Harry, uh, Harry does have a great sense of humour. He does, doesn't he? You know, we know. Was brilliant, yeah. yeah, and I like the fact that he wanted to come back as an elephant. I'd like to come back as an elephant. Mm -hmm. um, some of it, though, was so cringe. I mean, what's your favourite smell? Yeah, my yeah. wife. Yeah, yeah. Just, uh, yeah but, the, but the answer yeah. when he said, "Well, what you know," and, and what it was the worst smell when he said, "You." Yeah, <laughs> yes. well, that was brilliant. Yeah. I watched it. Arthur and, and saw that little twinkle that made Harry so popular back a bit. Um, we haven't seen that for quite no, a while. You know, I'll tell you this, Sarah, now. I loved working with Harry. He was just a joy to work with. And he used to say, after the end of every trip, we'd go to the pub and we'd have a drink with him and he would uh, chat about the tour and what we'd done and what he didn't like and what he liked. And then he would pay the bill. And, 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 he'd, and he'd said to us on, on several occasions, I do my best to help you. And in that book, you know, I bought that book too, and I only read two, two or three chapters, I couldn't read any more of it. And it, it was going on about the press blaming him for everything, you know. We made him into a star, you know, when he was playing with Usain Bolt or he was hugging the Jamaican Prime Minister or playing with the kids on Copacabana Beach. It was fantastic. He was a, he was a, a superstar. Mm -hmm. And now I think he's just a sad, and he looks so miserable. He's got none of his friends around him now. Oh, and that's the sad thing. And they were a but you know, you bond with your people you've been through school yeah, and everything, exactly. particularly the sort of private school institutions. You make friends for life. Well, and they've been some, well. yeah, and he's yeah. been summarily being dumped. He's dumped them all, and you look at why that's happened, and, and you just think we'd love to see that twinkle back. And he would have been a huge positive asset in the sort of supporting the king if he. But, but he wasn't happy, yeah. and he wasn't happy even before Meghan came along. I mean, you're absolutely right, Arthur. He was brilliant on jobs, and he's brilliant with kids, and brilliant in orphanages. All we've been with him all around the world. Mm. But he wasn't happy. And actually, I think I respectfully disagree with you guys. Now, I think now he is happy. I think Meghan makes him happy. We can obviously debate the the pros and the cons of of why that is. But he's happy. And yes, he probably made his family quite unhappy, but I think he's living his best life. Now, I personally don't think the way to live your best life is to go on t TV and write a book and trash your family. That is not the way to do it. But Harry obviously thinks it is, and it's part of his all journey. All that makes him happy there is journey. the money he gets for it. That's all that well, makes him happy. I don't think that's right. Oh no, because you don't, don't do that to your family. Right. You don't. I agree. The most no, important thing I in your life you. is your family, and you don't trash your family. I agree. You and I both value yeah, our families very, very much. We're very, yeah, yeah, you and I would never, ever do no, this. No, you don't but trash your family. I don't think he's done it for the money. I think he's done it for his journey, his own truth journey. He's had so much therapy. Not that there's anything wrong with that, obviously. It's very good that you should get therapy for your mental health. But I think he feels, and also as a, as a, a psychiatrist friend of mine said to me, as a royal, he's always done everything in public and this is the only way he knows how. Uh, that is all we've got time for this week. My thanks to Arthur, Rupert and Emily. We will be back next week with all of the latest on the royal family. We hope you can join us again. We'll see you then.